ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I don't have a table. Hey, Kevin, would you mind grabbing that for me? Kevin, gee, thank you. <laughs> I forgot something. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know. It's just, it's a... Uh, looks lighter than it is. I don't know if you have ever had one of those um, weeks, seasons of life. I know you have actually, where everything seems to go wrong, right? Like it just sort of like piles on top of each other, one thing after another. Several years ago, I was um, preparing to lead a, a group of, actually several groups of students on various missions trips. And that's always a little bit of a taxing time just in and of itself for me and my family. You're gone a lot. And you're, the way I kind of structured it at this time, because our, our group had grown and we had multiple teams going out to multiple places. And so I would kind of bounce around and, and go be with some of the students in one location and then then fly out to meet students that were maybe already on a trip somewhere else and then go from there to a third location. And, and so just before we were all going to leave, um, it was a Sunday morning and we were doing a, a commissioning service. The students would come up at the beginning of service and, and Pastor Jeff or Pastor Brian or whoever would pray over them and the church would pray for them and send them out. And I could tell kind of in that service, I was like, I'm not feeling that great. And by the time I got home that afternoon, um, I had 104 fever. Um, I was laying on the couch, I was delirious. My wife loves to tell the story because apparently I was saying crazy things and doing all this sort of stuff. And I, I'm, I'm, I like self-diagnosed myself with uh, West Nile virus, I Googled it. And, um, and, and then, so a few days later, I'm kind of recovering from this and it's time to go on the trips and I'm about to leave and, and I got a first group of students going down to Roseland on the south side of, uh, side of Chicago. And, we're about to leave and my wife calls and our water heater's out, right? And I've got a bunch of kids here. There's nothing I can do. And, and, and so I call my father-in-law and I see if he can get over there so my family can have hot water while I'm gone over the next two weeks. And I get down into Chicago and um, again, I could tell, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not feeling great. And I was, I was scheduled to teach that night. And so I taught the, the opening introductory session to our students and our team time. And, and I could tell like I was going down fast. And I went, immediately stopped teaching, went into the back room and just started throwing up. Um, and Ken O'Brien, one of my adult leaders said, man, you're, you gotta go home. Um, and so about midnight that night, like uh, one of our, our other adults drove me back to the suburbs and um, Sherry took me to CDH or uh, uh, Del Nor and I was passing kidney stones. Um, and I was like, that explains a lot. And so I'm, I'm in the hospital, I'm kind of recovering from that and I get out literally just in time to catch my flight to Ecuador. And I get on this flight to Ecuador and, um, and I get to Atlanta and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to make it. Like I felt horrible. And, and I was at that time, I'm kind of debating, do I, do I try to reschedule a flight and get home? Do I just finish this out and get down there? And so I just took some, some something, I don't know, whatever the doctor gave me. And I, I managed the pain and I got down to Ecuador and, and I'm in Ecuador and they're picking some of the leaders that would see me every year from El Refugio, pick me up at the airport and they say, you don't look good. You know, like that's never a great sign when that's somebody's introductory comment to you, you know? And, and they were right, I didn't look good and I didn't feel good. Um, and so I'm in Ecuador for a few days and I'm with that team and, and starting to kind of maybe mend a little bit, but not feeling great. And I, I catch my flight from Ecuador to meet up with the team in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. And I arrive there and I'm starting kind of on that upward trend and my wife calls um, and, and says that, um, that my grandma passed away, right? And I'm, I'm, again, I'm responsible to teach these, these sessions with these kids and I'm grieving at the one hand and, and sort of just kind of in this whirlwind at the other hand and not even sure in that moment how to respond and I'm away from my family when you really wanna be with them and all of this is going on. And when you have a season like that, if most of us, I think intuitively, sort of go to that place of where, where is relief going to come from? When, when, is this, when is this going to end? And I tell you all of this because today we're beginning a new series called Jesus of the Prophets. 
And we're going to together look at how the prophets, prior to the arrival of Jesus, in the midst of pain and suffering, in the midst of consequences of sin, are looking forward with hope and anticipation for something better, for, for the day when relief is going to come. And they're going to be restored back into a relationship with their God. Now, as we begin this series, I think it's helpful, at least for me, to take just a, a moment or two to talk about who the prophets were and the role that they were asked to play in this in the story of God and the story of Israel and really in, in, in the history, our understanding of salvation. First, I think it's helpful for us to understand that the, the responsibility of the prophet, now oftentimes, like if you look at or hear people talk about the idea of prophecy or being a prophet, a lot of times we assume that that means some idea of being able to predict or forecast the future. And, and in ancient cultures, that's oftentimes what they meant when they talked about somebody being a prophet. But in, in the nation of Israel and amongst God's people, that was not the primary responsibility or role or capability of a prophet. Really what they were charged with, given the responsibility for, was to be the, the voice piece of God to his people, to speak on God's behalf um, for them and to them. And, and this point in history of Israel, they, there's a lot of rebellion. And so oftentimes the prophet's words are not welcomed. They're not well received. That to be, if God were to show up and say, I want you to be the prophet to my people, that likely for you is going to mean you're not, you're not well liked. Um, you're not going to get invited to a lot of neighborhood block parties, right? Because when you show up, you've got some hard things to say and to tell people, and they're not always looking forward to hearing it. See, the people of Israel, they were called by God to be, to be this representative um, of, of, of God's character to the nations around them. This was their part in the covenant relationship that had been formed with God. Why, why God called Abraham and called him out of Egypt and said, I want you to be this picture of who I am to the world around you. But greed and corruption and, and compromise has worked its way in and it's begun to define Israel's leaders, they're, they're many of their kings and now some of their priests as well and even some of the prophets. Are, are, are basing their prophecy on who is the highest bidder. And so as a result, Israel looks a lot less like the character of God and looks more and more like the pagan nations around them. And that's where these prophets that God sends enter the picture. They're there to be the voice of God calling the people back. It's their role to, to represent um, uh, God's message on his behalf. And as they do so, oftentimes they're, they're, they're doing several things. One is there, there's this degree of, of accusation. They're calling out sin in, in the people of Israel. They're saying, look, this is what's going on. You're oppressing the poor and you're abusing those. You're giving benefit to those who can afford it and you're stealing land from those who can't. But in the midst of doing that, the prophet then is also welcoming the people back. Here's this overt call to repentance, this, this almost begging them. If, if you turn from your ways, God is merciful and he's forgiving and he, he welcomes you back into relationship. But he does so then with a warning, right? The prophet is saying, look, there is impending consequences as a result of, of your failure to uphold this covenant relationship, your part in this, this covenant. There is, there is judgment that's coming. In fact, oftentimes you'll see, and if you read any of the prophets, Old Testament prophets, you'll see them refer to the day of the Lord. Like that in the, in the prophets is, is this day of reckoning. This is this day that God is going to enact his judgment as a result of, of this unconfessed sin. But alongside all of this, things that are hard to hear, things that were unwelcomed. There is always anticipation and hope. 
The prophet is always pointing the people forward. He's a reminder that God's intended purposes among his people will not be thwarted, that, that that's not going to end. And there's this reminder and this call to return to their intended purpose, this relationship that they've had with, with their Yahweh God. And that God is not going to abandon his people. And yet the prophet is also pointing them forward to a day which God is, is, is going to do something even greater. Just as he rescued his people out of slavery from the land of Egypt, once again, God is going to be their rescuer. And they will be, they will live as his representatives here on earth. They're going to be this picture of his character around the world. This brings us now to the prophet Micah, one of the guys that has been given this responsibility, given this, this charge to speak these words to the people of Israel. At this point in time in Israel's history, they have now divided into two separate kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and Micah is, is living in the southern kingdom. And he is speaking, he's a, he's a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, who is up in, in the northern kingdom, and both of them are saying very, very similar things. And this is, this is Micah's words expressing his calling or, or what he's been charged with to do for the people of Israel. This is from Micah chapter 3, verse 8. He says it this way, he says, But as for me, I'm filled with, the, with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So Micah is now warning the people, I've been given this responsibility to call out corruption and greed, to call out the misuse of, of justice and the oppression of the poor. And he's saying it can't continue. Furthermore, he's saying the Assyrian army who waits just outside of our borders is going to come in and they're going to overthrow Israel, which is the northern kingdom. And they're going to take over Jerusalem, which is the capital city and in the southern kingdom. He says beyond that is the Babylonian Empire. And they will come and they'll finish what the Assyrians started. And they will take over the southern kingdom. And, and God's people are going to be sent into exile, into captivity. But again, along all of this, this accusation, all these difficult words, Micah speaks of hope and anticipation for something greater. He speaks words of, of rescue and relational um, restoration with their God. And this is where we pick things up in Micah chapter 5. I want us to look this morning at how, how Micah understands what God was going to do by sending a Messiah. And this is where we pick things up. This is Micah chapter 5 verse 1. He says, marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us, and they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Erathath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are uh, from of old, from ancient times. And therefore, Israel will, abandon, will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. And he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. And he will raise against them seven shepherds and eight commanders who will rule the land of Assyria with a sword and the land of Nimrod with a drawn sword. And he will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. Now this passage, I think all the prophets in general, one of the reasons that we, we struggle sometimes to read and understand the prophets is because they use so much of this this poetic and descriptive language, this illustrative language in order to explain to the people how God is going to work and move. But when Micah is declaring this to the people, the, one of the reasons we might be familiar with these few verses is because this is the same sort of text that, that Matthew cites in Matthew chapter 2 in the birth narrative of Jesus when the Magi are with Herod. 
And they're declaring and explaining why they've come to worship the one who is going to be born the king of the Jews. And they refer to Micah chapter 5. Because what Micah is picturing for the people is that despite the fact that this army is coming in and is going to overthrow them, there is a day coming when our king will arrive and he will restore the people of Israel. And so Micah throughout this text is defining for them, he's giving them context to understand the nature of the king. And this is what I want us to look at this morning. I want us to begin by looking at and understanding him as the ancient and future king. Again in verse 2, he says, But you, Bethlehem, Erathath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, one, of, one will come from you, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. So he points them forward whose origins are of old from ancient times. And he points them, them backwards. One of the storylines that we consistently hear throughout our, our, our culture and really our history is the story of, of the king who, for whatever reason, is away from his people and in the midst of his absence arises this, this replacement leader who is corrupt and cruel and abusive and oppressive. <coughs> Right? This is the story of, of Robin Hood. It's King Richard who, who is away defending his people. And, and while he's away, King George sits on the throne and he places all these heavy taxes on the people. And the sheriff of Nottingham right, goes around and, and collects all of this. And in the midst of that, there's all of this longing, this anticipation. When is, when is King Richard going to return? When is the goodness and the justice and, and, and the, the, the freedom that we had under King Richard, when is that going to be restored back into our, our lives? It's, it's if you look at the story of King Arthur, it's, it's the same trajectory. If you look at what Tolkien does in The Lord of the Rings, it, it's the very same thing. In fact, his third book in that, that series is called The Return of the King. Lewis does this incredibly well in, in the, the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. He talks about Aslan being away and what happens in his absence and then one day he's coming back, right? This is a story that we connect with that we long for in our hearts because it speaks to something that is innately inside of us. It speaks to a memory trace that we all carry with us as human beings of, of this designed relationship that we had. We talked about this last week. That, that we can remember there's something inside of us that longs for when God ruled and there was this uninhibited, unobstructed relationship with him and the experience was one of justice and the experience was one of, of connection and freedom and living according to our design. And this is what, this is what Micah is pointing the people to. He says there is coming for one who is going to be our future king and he is coming in order to return us to our created purpose. Micah is drawing on this memory trace that we all have and he says that this future king, this one who will come, he is our ancient king. He, he is the one who we know and remember and the stories that we tell. Jesus Christ is the ancient king that the heart longs for. This is why Micah's message to his people here is, is not merely a message of optimism, but rather one of hope. See, optimism can look at, at circumstances and can sort of e imagine a way that, that everything can turn out okay. But hope, at least biblical hope, is, is something greater. Hope is a state of anticipation for a future that is better than the present, and it's not dependent on circumstances working out just so, but rather biblical hope is dependent on a person. It's dependent on the one who will be the future king, the one who is also their ancient king. The Hebrew word for, for hope is the word kavah. And that word is often translated, it's translated hope, but sometimes it's translated to wait for. Because hope in the biblical sense is, is, is a sense of waiting for God to reveal himself, for God to act and do what he's promised. The prophet Isaiah says it this way in, in Isaiah 8, verse 17. 
He says, I will wait for, I will hope for, that same word, the Lord, who's hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob, but I will put my trust in him. See, the designation of the hope, your confidence, Micah is telling the people, rides in in who God is. And so this is the perspective that he's setting up for the people is he's in the midst of circumstances that are difficult and challenging, in the midst of of all these words of, of consequence and judgment, Micah wants to point them forward, but as he points them forward, he also points them backward. Because saying your hope is based in who God is. Your hope is based in the fact that you know him to be faithful and that you've seen it and you've experienced it in your life. Your hope is based in the very character of God. And he says this is your your ancient and your future king. So have hope, people of Israel. He's coming for us. Micah says we we will wait for the Lord. But then he continues on and he uses this second, I think, extraordinary imagery here to understand who the Messiah would be for us. And we see him as our shepherd king, our our shepherd king. Has anybody in here seen um, the Lego movies? Anybody? Just me? Okay, a couple of us. This is is perhaps a stretch, so work with me on this one. But when I was thinking about this, because there's, there's this oxymoron here. The, the, the people of Israel could understand the idea of, of a shepherd who became a king because of David, right? They knew that in their history. But Micah's setting up something different. He is setting up the king who is also a shepherd. And that did not easily, uh, is not easily reconcilable in their minds. See, the, the, the Lego movie is interesting because the main character, the hero of the story if, in the first movie is given this title of the special. The one, there's this calamity coming on Lego world and, and the special is going to emerge to be essentially their savior, right? And so the, the people of Lego land are looking for someone that they would define and describe as special that would stand out for how extraordinary they are. And, and Emmett, the main Lego person, comes up and emerges and is found to be the special. But what's so extraordinary about the special is that he's so incredibly ordinary. That there was this irreconcilable sense of that he is like everyone else, and yet this is the guy who is supposed to rescue. You see, this is what, this is very much what would be going on in the mind of uh, the people hearing Micah's word that your king is also going to be for you a shepherd, this incredibly ordinary, incredibly standard, even low-class citizen in their society. So why does Micah describe Jesus this way? Why does he want us to understand this way? If you look back in verse 4, he says, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. If you flip over just a page or two to the end of chapter two, Micah uses the same language to describe the the deliverance that is coming for Israel. He says, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob, and I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel, and I will bring them together like a sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. And the place will throng with people, and the one who breaks open the way will go up before them. And they will break through the gate and go out, and the king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. Do you see how he uses simultaneously this image or this picture of both the king and the shepherd? See, Jesus, or Jesus, Micah has just given us, Jesus is always the answer in church, and so my mind just went there. Micah has just given us this picture of the, the, the ancient, the once and future king who carries all the authority, all the ability, all the weight of, of his kingship. But now he's unexplained him in, t- in relational terms. And, and, and what he will do for us, he gives us this picture of him gathering his people together, this corralling of the people of Israel. He's pictured as one who is, who is this careful and loving God. Jesus uses this very same language. John chapter 10, when he describes his ministry, what he came here to do. We looked at this verse last week. 
just in, in verse 10, uh, John 10, verse 10, he talked about Jesus coming that we may have life and have it to the full. And then he goes on to explain this, this relationship. And he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and it does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf, wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. And the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And he says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, and I must bring them in also. And they too will listen to my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. You see, look at this juxtaposition that we have in Micah. The, the, the shepherding king alongside of this picture of the powerful reigning king. And, and what I believe that this is describing for us is the power and the might of God's incredible love for us. This is what Micah is highlighting to the people in verse 4 when he says, And they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the world. God is going to draw people in for his flock from the very ends of the earth. And it says that he will shepherd them in the strength of the Lord. This, this, this leading, this protecting, this providing work of the shepherd carries with it all the capacity and the ability and the authority of the once and future king. If you think about this from the perspective of, of Micah's original audience, the ones who are living this, the ones who are living with this imminent threat over their heads. And he's saying, this is going to be your hope, people of Israel. That the once and future king is also our shepherd who draws us to himself, who invites us back, and he will gather a remnant of Israel and he will gather people from, from the ends of the earth in order to bring them into his flock, into relationship with him. Micah says, this is your hope. This is what the people of Israel looked for. And then finally, Micah says, this king, this shepherding, this once and future king, this king is the king of peace. Because now we begin to discover what, what the result of his rule and reign will be. He says this in, in chapter 5 at the very beginning. I'm not going to go back there, but he says he will be our peace. But if you turn over to Micah chapter 4, at the very beginning of this chapter, he, he says this. He says, in the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established at the highest of the mountains. And it will be exalted above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. And many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of our God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. A nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. And everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. And no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. See here, Micah depicts the coming king as the king of peace. We actually talked about this on Christmas Eve because Isaiah would refer to the coming Messiah as the prince of peace. But the question for us that emerges is what kind of peace is this? I was reading this passage, working on this Friday afternoon in LAX airport. I'd gone out for a conference and I was sitting in the, the food court eating Chick-fil-A and, and literally just reading Micah 4, reading those verses. And it got busy in that place. And so uh, a man sort of knocked on my table and got my attention and said, hey, do you mind if I use the other half of your table? I said, no, you're welcome to. And he said, I don't want to disturb you. Just keep doing what you're doing. I just wanted a place to sit down. I said, okay, great. And, um, and so he sits down, and after a few moments, I, I look up, and he says, do you mind if I ask you what you're doing? I said, no. I, I, I said, I'm a pastor in the suburbs of Chicago, and I'm just working through some stuff that I, I'm going to preach on this weekend. And he goes, oh, I, I thought you guys just made that up when you got up there. <laughs> typically, no. I say. Um, 
And, and, and he began to share a little bit of his story and his family was from India. I couldn't catch quite if he was first generation in the United States or if his parents had uh, immigrated over, but, but he was Hindu. And, and he just began to open up about some of his own experiences with Hinduism and, and some of kind of his parents' version of his faith and some of actually what is going on politically and governmentally in India right now and some of his own being disillusioned with, with some things. And so sort of creating his own hybrid of, of the practice of Hinduism. And, and really as he was explaining this to me, what was extraordinary, and I was just reading Micah 4, what he felt like he was missing from the experiences was both a personal and a corporate sense of peace. What, what he looked at in the, his experience of the faith was, was this sense of, of a lack of, of resolved peace. In fact, he, he felt like it was being manipulated in order to control people. And I, I said, look, you can, you can find times in, in the history of the Christian church where people have used the gospel and the message of Jesus to manipulate and control people. We're not innocent of that either. But I said, what I try to encourage people to do is always to go back to the heart of what Jesus said and what he offers. And I said, I just, I just happened to be reading this when you came to said that what, what they were looking forward to prior to Jesus coming was that was the peace that he was going to offer. And I said, that's the crazy thing about, and this is how we process this as, as, as Christians, because there is still for us this sense of the already and the not yet, right? Because the, the peace that we talked about at Christmas was how, because of Jesus, despite conflict, despite chaos in our personal lives and the world around us, we can be at peace with him. Jesus has given us that. That is the already, right? We have that in the here and now. But Micah is not only referring here to a, a personal, relational sense of peace. He is pointing us forward to something that is yet to come for us, where God will exercise his full authority, where his kingdom will rule and reign in the fullness of, of, of his goodness and his grace. And he's saying in that day, there won't be just personal peace, there will be complete peace. And so we as the church, we look forward to that time, to that moment when God will once again, through Jesus, rule and reign. And he says, in that day, there will be no more violence, and there'll be no more pain, and there'll be no more suffering, there'll be no more hatred or anger. But peace is, is going to rule. So we, like the people of Israel, we wait for that day. Here in these verses, Micah is pointing us forward. He's pointing us forward to the time when God is going to, to enact his kingdom, the kingdom that he taught us to be a part of, the kingdom that he showed us when he was here on earth. And when he does, in that moment, there'll be peace. And he invites us into that. This morning, as we conclude our time together, we have the opportunity to, to remember how that peace was deliver to us that personal sense of peace. What Jesus afforded us through his cross. The worship team is going to come back up and as they do, um, I am going to, to guide us into the Lord's table and invite you to participate in remembering what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. You'll see as the ushers pass the plates, both of the cups are stacked together. You can take both of those and hold on to them. And then a moment I will come up and I will guide us in the receiving of the elements together. And just as a reminder, if you're new here with us, again, this is not a Chapel Street thing. This table doesn't belong to us. If you are in a relationship with Jesus, you're welcome to take communion with us this morning and we invite you to do so. If you're still exploring, if you're still looking, feel free to let the plate just pass you by and just um, take in the experience. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity just to be here together in community. We thank you for, for Micah's words of anticipation and hope as he pointed the people of Israel forward to their once and future king. And God, we pray that, that we would allow your rule and reign to happen here in our hearts and in this community. And Jesus, we look forward to the day when that will take full form. And when your, your kingdom will be here on earth in a, in, in a new heaven and a new earth. And God, as we come to your table this morning, we are reminded of the cost of the personal peace that we experience because of you. 
Remind us of your grace this morning, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.